Another episode about crack cycles. My name's Paul. Uh, this is my YouTube channel, and mostly I do pre Evo Harleys on this channel. But today we've got something different. This is not my bike. Uh, this is an Evo bike, so I'm excited about this. This is a little bit new for me. Um, I think these are great engines, though. So the backstory on this is that this bike belongs to a fellow named John. He lives not too far away from here. Um, he's a viewer of this channel, which is how he found me and he contacted me. And he's like, hey man, I've got this older Harley. The dealers won't touch it. My independents don't want to work on it. He even told me that one of his independents told him, oh, those Evo engines are nothing but trouble. You need to trade it in and get a twin cam, uh, which is insane to me. I would much rather have an Evo. Um, anyways, and so he got in contact with me and he's like, can I bring it to you? Can you put it in your little shop? Can you work on it? And you know, he's like, shoot a YouTube video about it while you're doing it. I'm like, yeah, sure. Uh, so here it is. So we're going to get this thing running. But real quick, um, old Harleys for me have always been kind of like a hobby slash side business. But they're starting to maybe move towards more of uh, my main business. And up until now, really the best way to contact me has been through Instagram direct messages. But I realize not everyone has Instagram. So... If you want to talk to me about having your bike worked on or you just want some advice about a bike or even you want me to go look at a bike before you purchase it an older harley um, contact me here i'm gonna movie magic a link somehow up here onto the screen so you can go to my store page or shop page or however youtube has it it's on my channel home screen and go to the contact page and if you want to get in touch with me about having some work done or a bike looked at or even if you just need some advice i'm happy to give out a little bit of free advice uh just to keep this hobby and and this culture of old harleys alive anyways uh this is a really cool bike it's got like a nice like late 90s early 2000s feel to it to me i really like it let's go check it out so here's the bike. It's a little cluttered here in the shop, so it's hard to get a good look at it. It's hard for me to get back and get it all in the frame. Um, but this is a 97 Fat Boy, and man, this bike is really beautiful. I love the red on it. It's been well taken care of, and you can tell that John, who owns this bike, just really loves it. And this is his baby, so I'm really happy and thankful that he trusted me to work on it. Um, what's wrong with it? Well, he's thinking that maybe the ignition module has gone out, or perhaps that the coil is bad, or some combination. Essentially, what we have here is a, uh, a, a crank no start condition. It'll spin over, will not run, he's pretty sure it doesn't have spark. Um, but I just wanted to do a quick walk around of it. You got this twisted sissy bar here. Um, I like all the, the stitching on the leather. Obviously, with this being a fat boy, you've got the big big chunky FL style front end with the solid cast mag wheels. Um, he's got the, the eagle head right there under the ignition switch. This is my favorite part of the bike. Got the eagle claw, talon, feathered foot, um, jiffy stand with the matching eagle claw passenger foot pegs. And um, if y'all y'all are regular viewers of this channel, you know that I tend to personally like more stripped down bikes like my shovel head here with not a lot of uh, accessories and not, not too dressed up. So while this isn't actually something I would probably own, I can still really appreciate that this is a nice bike. And uh, just like in general, this bike gives me like the feeling of like the late 90s, early 2000s. Like, I feel like this was a motorcycle from a point in time where Harley was making a quality product at an honest price, like a, a reasonable price that a working man could afford. A guy working a regular job or a girl working a regular job could go buy one of these. Their buddies could buy one like it and they could all ride them to Sturgis and buy the t-shirts that we think are cheesy today with a pack of Harleys and the pack of wolves howling at the moon and it says Sturgis or LA 2000 and that to me is a period of Harley culture that obviously I wasn't old enough to experience as a rider but I was definitely on the fringes of it with my aunt and uncle going and doing that and hearing all their stories seeing all their pictures talking to all their biker friends and and you know those shirts and the and the photo albums of disposable camera pictures um, that was a really fun era of Harley to me, I think, where people just rode their bikes and enjoyed it and, and a lot of camaraderie and not as much social media, not any social media really. Um, 
So while maybe having all of these accessories on the bike might be a little bit like that South Park episode of brother, 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 and people love to make fun of that stuff these days, I think this era is something that we've kind of lost and some of the fun of that era is maybe gone now. Uh, and for that reason alone, I really like this bike. So the first place we're gonna start is just verifying the complaint. In this case, customer states, engine cranks, but will not start. So we're gonna go ignition on, make sure we're in neutral, run, switch and run, and let's spin it over. some kind of relay clicking underneath the seat there and the starter never engaged. Alright so the seat is off and uh, you can see what we're working with here. There's a whole bunch of extra stuff. Um, under here a bunch of inline fuses and whatnot. I'm pretty sure this is for he's got you can see him right here a little LED light strip. You can turn it on and off and change the colors and such. So I'm pretty sure that's what all of that is. Um, I am gonna try and get some of it out of the way so that I can get down to what I need to see. Really, I, I just wanna be able to make this bike spin over good and solid. Um, that way I can actually check it for spark. And get all that out of the way. And see what else we need to get to down there. Um, while I'm here too, I'm going to grab the voltmeter and put it across the battery. Just make sure we have good battery voltage and double check all of these connections and just make sure everything's tight there. It just takes five minutes to check and anytime you're hunting anything you think might be an electrical issue, you know, ignition module or coil or whatever, uh, just little simple checks like that help a lot. 12-7. Mm, Looks like that's a pretty good battery. Go key on again. And, I, oh, was it that relay? Yeah, Alright, so this circuit breaker right there is tripping and resetting itself over and over again. And it only does it with the engine run start in, with the engine switch in run. So I'm gonna go grab a wiring diagram, or schematic or something, and see what that one is for. We'll go from there. All right, so I uh, did not have a shop manual for this particular bike. I had some earlier soft tail stuff, um, like late 80s, early 90s, but nothing for something this new. Um, so I went online and I printed off just basically the electrical section. Anyways, here is our circuit breaker that is tripping. Um, it is the ignition circuit breaker. It's the gray and red and black is the pairing on that circuit breaker. Uh, you can see it over here. We've got our battery right there. Battery positive comes over to the positive lug of the starter. Uh, we've got a 30 amp circuit breaker giving us circuit protection for this leg of the circuit to the ignition switch. Then from our ignition switch is where we go through that um, ignition circuit breaker. So the ignition circuit breaker is then our circuit protection for over here. So I would guess that we've got a uh, dead short, short ground somewhere over in this mess. Um, and we need to find that really before we can do anything else I would say. John had said that he was suspicious of perhaps he had wired something incorrectly or that something was shorted and, and burn up. So there might be a dead short in one of the ignition con components that is tripping out this ignition uh, circuit breaker. So spend a few minutes looking for that, but wiring diagram definitely helps point you in the right direction. All right, so I will show you all what I've figured out so far. I have taken the positive and negative wires off of the coil as well as remove the Dynatech wiring. The Dynatech that's currently on this bike is actually a Chinese copy. Um, 
John, who owns this bike, actually just left. He, he just brought me a new, real Dynatech. So we're gonna go down here to our white and black wire, which is factory positive. Ignition on, run switch. So there we go. We got good 12 volts right there. And um, with the coil unplugged, we are no longer tripping and resetting this resettable circuit breaker. So we either have something shorted in the coil or something shorted in the Dynatech. Next thing I'm gonna do is I've got the bike turned off. The leads for the voltmeter are on the primary side of the ignition coil. And we'll just go to ohms. Four ohms. So we are not dead shorted across the primary ignition coil. Um, I think that reading is a little bit high per the factory shop manual for a Harley coil. I don't know if this is a 3 ohm or a 5 ohm coil though. Really though, that's probably okay. I would say that our, our short here is somewhere in this wiring or in the ignition module down there because as you can hear, I can spin it over as long as I want. I went ahead and uh, undid the wiring to the Bose switch and took some dikes and cut all the zip ties. And we're going to go ahead and pull this module out. I'm pretty sure this module is bad. Um, the primary and secondary resistance of that coil are really close to being in spec. However, uh, Mr. John, who owns this bike, like I said, he stopped by the shop this morning with a couple boxes of parts, and he brought me another ignition module and another ignition coil and some other little small things too. Um, so we're just gonna replace the coil as well. He could probably keep that one as a spare. So uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say this is trash now. Time to open some parts. Um, John brought us a uh, drag specialties ignition coil. This is a 3 ohm dual fire coil based off of the part number and uh, you know, it says it right there on the side of the box, which is nice of them to tell you. And of course, we got the new Dynatech uh, 2000 and I. All right. Man. You gotta scan a freaking QR code to get the installation instructions. I don't know, I'm gonna get on the computer and print it off and come back. I hate working off computers, I like print. You hear that people, I like print. Printed shop manuals, printed directions, print. And you can take a pen and write on them. Blah. I'm getting old. Okay, I'm back. We have uh, paper directions like I like. Let's go put them to good use. Also, uh, I went ahead and set the dip switches on this thing before I put it in. It's a little easier to do out here, though it's not hard. Take your pocket knife or something and switch them around. There's a total of six switches on one of these um, ignition modules, and uh, you can use them to configure its various things. Read the manual. It's self-explanatory, but finally, before I get too far into stuff, I just want to check this. Um, timing cup. It needs to be the gold one. And that looks awful loose to me. I'm gonna pull I'm gonna pull this timing cup loose. I have seen these break the little tit um, in there that holds them onto the, the snout. Um, oh hey that's not even tight. Yeah I'm gonna go ahead and take that off and, and see how that looks behind there. I've got another one of those timing cups. We might go ahead and replace that if that one's damaged. Sure enough, look at that. Uh, that little tit does, might not come through well on uh, the camera, get it in focus, but it's it's kind of about to break off. This hole is bigger than that hole over there, and uh, I'm guessing that this bolt just was not tight, um, and that in the little bit that this did run, or while he was trying to get it running or whatever, um, this has been wallowing around in there and about to break so I'm glad I took a couple seconds just to check that like I said this is not the first time I've seen this on a Harley electronic ignition so we're gonna throw this in the scrap pile and bolt another one on I'm gonna feed the wires through 
quick little tip. Um, just take some electrical tape and wrap it around the end of this wire loom. It'll make it so you can actually pull the wires, uh, you know, through without the wire loom getting caught in the hole. Yeah, sorry, I just realized my shoulder and arm was blocking most of that last shot, but you get the idea. Pull the harness through and uh, a little tape wrapped around to keep the keep the uh, wire loom tight against the wires. It'll make it go through without trying to bunch the, the wire loom up. So I got started um, wiring. Let me zoom out so y'all can see what area of the bike I'm in over here. And... Um, I noticed the outside of this wiring sheath looks like there was a melted wire there at one point in time. The Vose wiring on this bike that goes to the Vose switch. This was just um, had this wire nut on it going down to the old ignition module. So I'm going to take a look at this wire. I actually think maybe. That's right in there where that, you know, would have been laying right there. I want to take a good look at this and make sure this wire isn't shorted out somewhere um, so we don't ruin this, this brand new Dynatech. See the wire right there? Uh, John had mentioned something about that he had tried to splice into this Bose switch or something and he thought it might need to be soldered, but this looks like this has just been twisted together and taped over. You can see the bare wire exposed right there, so I wonder if um, if this is somehow getting somewhere that, that that bare section of copper on that wire can ground out on the frame, or maybe those tanks, not the frame, you know what I mean, on, the, on like that tank mountain bolt or something. Uh, so I'm going to pull this connector out and get it on the bench and see if we can get it fixed. So here's the Vose connector. In order to get to it and actually have space to work on it, uh, you can see that I ended up taking the entire dash out. Um, I also unbolted that right hand side tank and just kind of scooted it over. It's resting on some rags. Um, but you can see here that it's been cut really close to the connector. There is the other port of the wire, um, some bare copper showing. It had this wire nut. Uh, electrical tape to it but it basically fell off the second I touched it so I'm gonna dead end that correctly these are Deutsch connectors so I will just uh, pull this whole entire wire out and get my Deutsch crimper and just make a new wire for this crimp a new end on push it back in and then we'll be able to run it over to the um, ignition module also one last little thing while I'm here uh, notice that your, this little crossover vent tube here on the top of the tanks um, this actually wasn't hooked up when I when I pulled the dashboard out, so I'll make sure when I put this back together I'll hook it up and I'll probably throw uh, some hose clamps or something on it so it can't vibrate itself back loose. So there's our hose connector. You can see it's been fixed. We're all attached, um, spliced back in, down to the Dynatech. Everything's all heat shrunk and covered with wire loom. And you can see there's that purple wire. I dead ended it. Um, the way I like to dead end wire, sometimes I'll put a butt splice on them and heat shrink it on there. Other times I'll just take a piece of the appropriate size heat shrink and you can slide it down over the wire and heat shrink it and then take a set of pliers and crimp the end while it's still hot and it'll seal itself up at the end and then it's not coming off of there and it looks nice and clean. So, um, put the tanks back together and uh, put the dashboard and the leather and all that back in and then we'll finish wiring up the coil and uh, then it'll be time to time this thing. All right, so we got the tank back tight. Uh, I double checked the tank fasteners on this left tank. I'm glad I did because they were not tight. I probably got a turn and a half on the back one and like three or four on the front. Um, dashboard's back in, the little leather cover is back in. Getting all the wires and stuff pretty and organized and neat under there was probably the most aggravating part, but it's in there, um, everything works, so we're good to go, and we can keep moving on with the Dynatech installation. 
coil is wired up, uh, your white wire, in this case it's white and black, which is your ignition positive, goes to one side of the coil along with the white wire for the Dynatec, and then your pink Dynatec wire goes to the other one. And then I will also just note the way that I do ring terminals. A lot of ring terminals are chintzy and crappy. Even the heat shrink ones aren't the best. So I pretty much just uh, crimp my terminal down and slide some heat shrink over it and then shrink that down. That ends up looking nice and clean and um, it's, it's pretty well, you know, safe and insulated. And, and it's not, I wouldn't say it's weatherproof. I wouldn't take this through a car wash, but it's certainly better than just crimping onto those little chintzy uh, terminals that you get at the store. So, yeah. All right, got the bike up on the stand. Price is strapped onto there. Um, this bike was a little tippy. I've kind of gotten in the habit of doing that on any bike I jack up. Uh, basically, we need to just get it shifted up into the highest gear possible, fourth gear, fifth gear. No, this is too new to be a four-speed, five-speed, five, five speed, fifth gear. Um, and then we can turn the rear tire over. I'm going to pull the spark plugs out to make it easier to spin the engine over. So what we want to do here is grab the back tire and we're just going to spin it forward. And that will also turn our engine. And we want to be on top dead center for the front cylinder on the compression stroke. And you might notice I've got compression tester uh, just screwed in hand tight to the front cylinder we're not actually doing a compression test all that is is just letting you know when I'm on compression stroke obviously this is a four cycle engine four stroke engine whatever you want to call it so your piston is going to come up to top dead center twice in one complete power cycle of the engine so it's going to come all the way to top dead center uh, at the top of the compression stroke and then it's going to come to top dead center again at the end of the exhaust stroke right before your uh, intake stroke, the downstroke happens. Um, obviously, when you're on the compression stroke, both valves are closed. Your intake and exhaust valves are both closed to make compression. When you're at the end of the exhaust stroke, your exhaust valve is open, and then since you're gonna start your intake stroke next, you have that period of overlap where both the exhaust and the intake valve are open at the same time, so you won't be making any compression there. So it'll be easy to see uh, which top dead center we're on just by sticking that gauge in there. So once you see the needle kind of start to move, um, you know you're on the compression stroke. You're never actually gonna see like pounds on the gauge. This is a lot easier to do with two people. You don't even need a gauge. You can just uh, hold your thumb over the front cylinder. But regardless, shop manual says that the vertical line is our static timing mark. So you just uh, line it up here in your inspection plug. The light will work. And you just want it to be centered. Now we can go over to the Dynatech and time it. Okay, so I obviously still need to dead end those two wires. Regardless, key switch is on, ignition is in run. You can see our red LED is lit. And I've got these just, you know, finger tight. What you want to do is take your ignition and rotate it to the right until that LED just turns off. So, I'll show you that again. LED is on. We're going to rotate it clockwise till it just turns off. And where it just turns off, you are now static timed, assuming that the engine is at top dead center, compression stroke, front cylinder. And go ahead, take your screwdriver and uh, tighten those screws down. Okay, uh, the timing plugs back in, spark plugs are back in and torqued. Petcock is on. Um, go full choke. I already did the accelerator pump once. Uh, with it static timed like this, this is good enough to run. A lot of people will just static time one of these engines and then just send it and they say that's good enough. Um, you can put a plastic plug in here and dynamically time it. I might do that later and show you all how to do that as well. But for now, um, let's spin this thing over and see if it'll fire up. Make sure we're in neutral, which we are. Run and start. I bet this carburetor is completely dry if you will, because this thing's been sitting a while. Yep. One more squirt. Oh, come on, baby. things cold nature. You cannot let that choke off at all. It does run though, so woo! -hoo!
think this thing needs some carburetor work, but it is at least running. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah, this thing doesn't take throttle at all. It's so cold. I wonder if this thing has a intake leak or maybe this, these jets are just way wrong for it. So, um, you have to hold the choke out to keep this bike to run. If you spray some carburetor cleaner. Yeah. Let go of the choke, bike dies. Um, this obviously has a, an intake leak. It's really bad. Um, I talked to the guy who owns this though. And he said that it's been like this basically since he bought the bike and that he always just has to sit there and hold the choke on it uh, for a really long time until it's sort of, well, sort of kind of idle. And then he says he'll take off up the road and just keep it running with his wrist. And eventually after uh, riding it long enough, um, th then it'll, it'll run good and, um, and, and idle, I guess. So I asked him if he wanted me to um, go any further with this. I kind of told him what his bill was right now, and he said no, he doesn't want me to pull the carburetor off and reseal the intake manifold. Just uh, try and let this thing run till it's warmed up, and then go take it for a test ride and make sure it runs good and accelerates good once it's warm. Um, I'm sure it's going to be popping and spitting and sputtering while it's cold and probably die on me. So um, I'm going to leave it on a battery charger overnight. The battery seems a little weak in this bike, and then I guess I'm going to ride it in the morning and assuming it does reasonably well, uh, we'll give it back to the customer. It's the next day, and as you can see, the bike is sitting here in my backyard. My wife and I just got it out of the building. It will idle, um, though I would say not well, and it probably had to sit there with me holding the choke probably 15 minutes before it would get to this point of attempting to idle. Um, it doesn't take throttle well. You gotta kinda, you know, baby it on the throttle. Maybe it'll get better as it warms up. Come on. So I'm not gonna go far or fast just because of that. Yeah. didn't come through on camera but just did its very first car part back through the car there goes another one pretty typical uh, for one of these bikes when they have an intake leak to do that that's very common common behavior good cough right there at, at real light throttle positions. Seems like uh, once you get it past that point of, you know, where the intake leak is causing that cough, uh, this thing has good power though. John was saying, oh man, it'll, it'll pull right up to 100 miles an hour, and I'm not gonna go try that. Uh, I'm sure it will. That's uh, probably not how I would want my 
my mechanic riding my bike though. We will get on it a little bit right here though. Good straight away. weird having mirrors and turn signals. <laughs> um, after, after, you know, I spend a lot of time on bikes that don't. <laughs> Obviously my iron head has mirrors and turn signals, but uh, if you've ever ridden an iron head, you'll know that mirrors on the iron head are like a suggestion. They don't really actually work stop here and take a picture for a thumbnail for the video. I think this will be a good spot. The little uh, neutral indicator light too. It's funny because that's another thing that I'm not used to having. And a speedometer. I don't have that on, on a bunch of stuff I've owned. That looks pretty good though. Got a nice looking bike there, Mr. John. There we go. One thumbnail picture incoming. Let's go back home.
get his bike parked in the driveway and under the cover, and I'll probably wash it for him. And that's the end of this episode. Thank you all for watching.